Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. My name is Eirik. Welcome into my studio. Today would normally be a day for the Patreon series of videos, but due to the unfortunate circumstances Italy is going through right now, this video has been delayed until next week. Instead, you will get a video on casting a mother mold in plaster, which is a little bit less glamorous than a video on sculpting, but it's just as important to ending up with a decent, decent final product. What I've done to start here is I've planned out where the two pieces of the model mold that will make up the back half of the mold will separate. If I made one piece for the back half of this mold, it wouldn't come off and my casts would be stuck inside the model mold, forcing me to break the mold in order to get the cast out, which is of course not a good thing. If you imagine a sphere, you need to make sure the model mold does not go over the apex of the curve of that sphere on either side. If it does go over, the mother mold won't come off, it will be locked in place. This is a slightly simplified scenario of course, our mold is not a sphere. The back of the mold here has similar qualities to a sphere however, but the bumps and lumps that exist on the surface makes it a little bit more complex. The best way to ensure a mother mold will come off if you are even slightly concerned about it locking on and getting stuck is to create a mother mold half made up of two pieces, or more than two pieces. It's slightly more time consuming than simply making one piece, but it saves you a lot of time in the end if you do it right. Where to place the wall to separate the two pieces that'll make up the back half will depend on the shape of your mold. Ideally, it will be placed along the apex of forms that make up your mold. A good trick you can use is to step back and see if all the areas of your silicone that you're trying to cover with plaster is visible to you. If any part seems to be disappearing behind the horizon, turning under itself so you can't see it anymore, you have a spot that your plaster mother mold is going to get stuck, or could potentially get stuck at least. From where you are watching right now, you can see that every part of the silicone on this side of the wall is visible. Nothing disappears from view from us. If you go back to the beginning of the video, before the wall was applied, you'll be able to see that large parts of the silicone on the far side of the clay wall can't be seen. You should always look at the silicone directly in line with the direction you want the mold piece to come off. If possible, begin looking directly at the back and see if the mold mold piece can come off that way, directly square to the sculpture. If not, move over to a three-quarter view like you see here and see if you can split the model mold half in two. Would it come off then? If the answer is no, even then, which is the case on the front half of this mold, and you'll have to keep watching until we get to the front and I'll cover what to do about what to do in that scenario. The clay wall separates the two halves of our model mold and will become the surface of one half of our plaster model mold. So it needs to be pretty smooth, as it's going to become the surface of a plaster mold. The back side of it, the one that we're not casting right now, can be really rough and should be reinforced with clay so it's sturdy and won't buckle or move while you brush plaster onto it. Registration keys are drilled into the clay wall in order to make sure the two pieces come back together in the same way every time. Now we're also going to drill holes and, and bolt the two pieces together into one half, but registration keys are, are good practice regardless. Make sure the keys are fairly shallow, you don't want them to be too deep as the other half of the plaster mother mold could potentially get stuck. Deep holes tend to trap more air bubbles also, it's harder to get plaster in there. So shallow holes work well for registration without trapping air bubbles or locking the two pieces together. Mixing plaster is very straightforward. You always put the powder into the water, slowly sifting it in. Keep going until you've built up a shallow island of plaster powder in your water. By waiting for a minute or so, now the water will soak into the plaster powder and make mixing the two together a lot easier, leaving you with less lumps to break up. And the less mixing you need to do, the better as mixing introduces air into the plaster mixture. Air that can then be trapped in your plaster creating air bubbles which are weak and prone to crack and break. Use a soft bristle brush of appropriate size to brush the plaster onto the surface. 
For the splash coat, which is what we're doing here, we are after a thin but even layer of plastic. Thick enough so that none of the silicone shows through, but not thicker than a few millimeters. And you want it even because an uneven layer could cause warping and all sorts of stuff. So we want to make sure that all our layers are pretty even here. Let the splash coat dry a little bit until it's firm to the touch. Now, this takes around 15 to 20 minutes, depending on your mix, the temperature of the water in your mix, and the climate you are in. Plaster can struggle to bond to itself if you let it dry for too long. So once you start this process, you should keep going until the piece is done. Beginning the burlap stage once the plaster is firm, but before the plaster has heated up, is recommended. To make sure the burlap sticks well to the splash coat, I brush on fresh plaster all over the piece. This moistens the plaster back up a little bit and it helps with adhesion. The burlap is then dipped into plaster and then it's laid onto the piece. I like using both my hands and a brush to tamp the burlap down so there are no air bubbles between the splash coat and the burlap. Every piece of burlap should overlap the last one and none of them should stick up outside the edges of your mold. I add about 2-3 layers of burlap, all of them overlapping each other for strength and in a kind of crisscrossing pattern to even add more strength. Now this adds a lot of strength and durability to your mother mold. However, the edges need even more strength as most of the wear and tear will be concentrated along these edges. This means also along the edge that will connect the two pieces of the back half together where we built the clay wall, the plaster, that's where we built the clay wall. There will be a ton of force concentrated here on this section as clamping pressure will be put on it to hold the two pieces together and when the mold lays open, all the weight of the mold and the casting material inside will be concentrated along this edge as the two halves are trying to kind of push each other apart. And so to reinforce the wall, I wait for my plaster to reach what we call the cream cheese stage where it doesn't run and can be sculpted with quite easily. The time it takes for the plaster to reach this state varies. I just mix a bowl of plaster and then I keep a close eye on it as it slowly sets up. Once it reaches the cream cheese stage and doesn't run anymore, I strike and begin building the walls. To do this, I use a very simple metal spatula that you can probably get at most art stores, I imagine, or perhaps even a hardware store. And I try my best to make the walls square and neat. The neater and smoother they are, the less they'll break apart and crumble over time. A beautiful and well-made mold lasts a lot longer and you'll have a larger chance of success casting in it than you will if you make a poor, ugly mold. Even though they might function exactly the same way. Let's thank today's sponsors, my Patreon supporters on Patreon, who have ensured the continued existence of this channel and allowed me to upgrade my gear bit by bit, making better looking and better sounding content for all of you watching. If you are interested in supporting the channel, or perhaps interested in getting personal feedback on your sculptures from me, then Patreon is the place for you. You'll get in-depth feedback on techniques and how you can apply them to your own work. Anything sculpture related goes, we can talk about armatures, supplies, mold making, anything you need help with in your sculpting endeavors. So check it out, there is a link in the description below. And again, thank you so much to those of you who have given generously and supported me. It really means the world. I'll even use a rasp as the plaster is setting up in order to make sure the mold is as pretty as I can make it. This yellow rasp here is made by Stanley. Stanley makes nice rasps that are available in most hardware stores all over the world, I think. And now we have to wait for a bit. Usually I'd wait about a few hours, though if you are in a rush, you can skip waiting and get directly back into it. However, waiting for a few hours and making sure the plaster is set up properly is recommended. Plaster does stick to plaster, even though the bond is not, is not very strong, it is, still, it is still going to bond. So, to make sure the two pieces come apart without causing any damage, a release agent must be applied to the first piece we made. And in, th in this case, and in most cases when it comes to plaster, I prefer to use Vaseline. In this scenario, I had to tape the piece uh, to the silicone so it wouldn't fall off. Which tells me that we're likely going to have an easy time getting this mother mold off later on. While it's a bit of an inconvenience now and something we must work around, it will serve us well later in the future. 
Then it's rinse and repeat, really. We do exactly what we did in the first step. A layer of plaster a few millimeters thick, the two, three layers of burlap all overlapping each other for strength. Then using cream cheese plaster to build walls along the edges to ensure that the mold live long and prosperous. With the back half finished, it's time to tackle the front half. The front half is a lot more complex than the back, way more complex actually. So on the front, we're not gonna focus too much on the application of plaster, which we've already covered, but on why I created the model mold the way I did, what my thinking was and how I reached the conclusions that I reached. Because of the protruding leg, the left leg of my sculpture, the front can't simply be made into two pieces. The leg is at an angle as well, it kind of angles inwards, which would have created a problem making two pieces. It would have locked those two pieces on. So I decided to go with three pieces here. One big piece for the bottom half below the knee of the protruding leg, and then two more for the more complex upper half. Now the upper half has all these weird protrusions from the arms being cut off, which makes it a lot more complex. Pulling the plaster model mold directly off square with the front of the sculpture would not work because of this and because of the overhang underneath the chin. The model mold would get stuck underneath the chin. Remember that severe that we spoke about earlier. So splitting the top half in two means that it can be pulled off in a more sideways or three quarter direction rather than directly square off from the front, allowing for clearance from underneath the chin. I began with the bottom piece as the weight of the plaster on the clay wall didn't seem like it would hold to me. So I always prefer starting with a piece at the bottom, a piece that touches the base, the wooden base that the sculpture is situated on, as it helps stabilize the sculpture. If you have large, heavy model mold pieces at the top, weighing heavily on the piece, it can wobble, it can bend the sculpture. It's not a good idea. It can damage the mold and the piece before you finish the mold. You can see that I've built a wall at an angle larger than 90 degrees to the wooden base that the sculpture is attached to. Now the bottom piece will be the first piece to come off from the front and a larger than 90 degree angle ensures it's the piece that will come off the easiest. The two upper half pieces will be locked in place behind what will for them be a less than 90 degree wall. If you want to control which piece comes off first, then airing on the side of either more or less than 90 degrees is desirable. If you try to stay at exactly 90 degrees, the chance of making a mistake or, or being a few degrees off, making the mold hard to take apart or coming apart in a way that you do not expect, can happen and this might not be what you desire. So planning this out and visualizing it in your head is very useful if you know how the mold is going to work even before you make it the chance of success increases. So always keep in mind, a larger than 90 degree wall signifies that the piece of model mold will come off first and a less than 90 degree wall usually will come off last. There are exceptions and these rules don't always apply of course, but they're a safe and easy course of action that leaves you with a high chance of success and a low chance of failure which is of course what we all strive for. Let's take a quick second to talk about some updates that's been made to my Patreon page. A few months ago, I started putting out exclusive Patreon content, videos that you will only have access to if you are my supporter on Patreon. The first series we have embarked on is the Beginner's Guide to Figure Sculpture, where we will cover how to sculpt a standing nude female figure in contraposto in Half-Life's S scale. I will cover everything from the armature, the sculpting, and eventually the mold making. This will be the one place, the one stop, for all the answers you'll need for sculpting a standing nude figure. Whether you sculpt from life or from photo reference, we will cover how to work from both. One video will be released on the first Thursday of every month. The video will be longer than what you're used to seeing here, around 30 to 45 minutes long. It will all be real-time footage, no time lapses, and I will do my best to use a very linear process with clearly defined steps, making it both easy to follow and easier to do on your own. 
Any patron pledging $5 or more will get access to the video. I'm excited to finally be putting out exclusive Patreon content to my Patreon supporter, whose support is greatly appreciated. So check out my Patreon page to watch these videos by clicking the link in the description below. In order to increase the flexural strength of the plaster piece, or in layman terms, keeping them from bending and breaking in half, I had a small metal rod across all the pieces. This keeps the plaster pieces a bit stiffer and also gives me something to grab onto while trying to pry the mold apart. It also gives me something to attach bungee cords to while strapping the mold together during the creation of a cast. And you'll see that in a future video, or you might have seen it in one of the past videos I've made on casting already. This process is one of repetition, a lot of repetition. The mental part of it is making sure the repetition is not wasted by having a decent plan to begin with, not flying by the seat of your pants. Trying to imagine how the mold will come apart before even beginning helps, and the more molds you make, the easier this becomes. Visualization is a large part of my workflow, no matter if I make molds or sculpture. I always try to think a lot before I do anything. I think you've seen enough plaster pieces being made now. The last piece is made exactly the same way all the other pieces were made. The last step is to drill holes that we can use to hold the pieces together with bolts during casting. Now, I prefer to drill these holes before the mold comes apart, comes off the silicone, as right now, while the plaster mother mold is on the silicone, everything is registered perfectly. Once you begin taking pieces apart, the chance of something going wrong, something distorting and changing is, becomes greater, even though we have registration keys in our plaster. Sometimes pieces come apart real easy, and other times there is need for a little bit of force. Plaster isn't as strong as you would think, especially if you haven't let it cure for, for several weeks, let it completely dry out, which can sometimes take a few weeks if you don't have an oven. And so when you're using a hammer and a chisel, you want to be really, really careful. It would be very sad to break the mold now at the very last minute. However, every piece came off quite easy. One piece was a little resistant and in order to help that piece come off easier, once I begin casting, I'll lightly sand and round off some of the corners on the inside of the piece so it slices off the silicone a little bit easier. You can also grease it up a bit with Vaseline, which will make it slide nice and easy across the silicon surface. Thank you for watching and stay tuned for a new video next Thursday. Hit the subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever a new video comes out. If you enjoyed the video, click the like button and share it with your friends and family. It helps me out a lot. Thank you for watching, stay creative and I hope to see you in the next one.